Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, unschooling mom and author, bringing you interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free Exploring Unschooling ebook, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hi everyone, I'm Pan Larickia and this is episode number 47 of the podcast. It's the 23rd of November 2016 as I record this intro. And it's Q&A time. Ann Oman and Anna Brown join me to answer your questions. I just want to say we love digging into your questions. They remind us of our own journeys and we continue to explore and learn through your questions. So thank you for that. This month, we dive into unschooling principles versus expectations, talking with kids about Santa, unschooling budgets, the challenges of releasing food control, and developing writing skills. And remember, if you'd like to submit a question, just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the link. Uh, This week, I have still been writing away in the morning, so 3,000 words a day or so, still on track to hit 50,000 words by the end of the month for NaNoWriMo, so yay. (laughs) Uh, Michael's been home for a couple of days and has caught a bug, so I've been giving him extra care while he stays low-key and sleeps to recover. Uh, Last Friday, I drove into the city to meet up with my friend and book editor, Alex. I showed up at the airport when her flight landed, and we hung out there for a couple of hours before she needed to be on her way. It was tons of fun to catch up, and I'm sure we could have talked for many more hours. Oh, and a couple of days ago, we rented a truck and moved a lot of furniture out of my mother-in-law's house, so apparently it's been a pretty busy week. I want to give a big thank you to everyone supporting the show on Patreon, especially to new patron Laura Mascaro. Thanks, Laura. It means a lot to me that you guys enjoy the show enough to contribute where you can. Knowing you're with me keeps me motivated, especially now as I'm doing extra stuff to get a head start on the shows over the holidays, so I'll be set to spend the time with my family. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring and Schooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash exploring and schooling. And this week's quote comes from Joyce Federal. Unfortunately, most people are convinced that when control fails, it's because they didn't control enough. I think one of the challenges of moving to unschooling is discovering how many ways we actually try to elicit control over our children, even over our spouse and our extended family and friends. And even as we start releasing the most obvious tools of control, like insisting our children do X or Y, When things feel like they're starting to go off the rails, it can be so tempting to think that we're failing and we need to revert back to control, that we're not controlling enough. But if we take the time to dive deeper, often we discover that we're still trying to exert control, only in less obvious ways. The problem isn't that we're not controlling enough, it's that we're still controlling too much. That can be really hard to see at first, especially when our children's lives are probably already less controlled than we grew up with. Remember that not controlling isn't about leaving them on their own to sink or swim, though. There's a whole world of possibilities between being controlling and being hands-off. There is so much digging and learning to do as we're de-schooling, but it's really worth the effort, both for our relationships with our children and for our children's own learning about themselves and the world. They're developing self-awareness and discovering how capable they really are. It is beautiful. And now, on to the questions. Welcome to another Q&A episode. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and I'm happy to be joined again by Anne Oman and Anna Brown. Hi to you both. Hello. Hello. Hi, Hi, thank you so much for joining me. I have so much fun chatting about all these questions with you. It's fun to dig in. So let's get started. You want to go first, Anna? Sure. 
Okay, so question number one is from Aparajita, and I hope I said that okay. <laughs> um, I have an almost three-year-old son, and we've been trying to make changes that lead toward radical unschooling. So we have tried to say yes more and let go of the controls we've had, especially over technology. My son spends a lot of time on his tablet. I used to find it alarming, but I see that he is learning and happy. However, I have also read that we need to keep offering interesting experiences and activities, not constantly though, so that there are other things that are sparkly. How do I do this? He often refuses to go out and do anything else when I take out other toys or activities when engaged with his iPad, and sometimes I feel bad that he missed an outing. I don't want to force him at all. What can I do? P.S. I have a six-month-old, too, so I feel like we stay home a lot more than we would have if it was just him and I, and I'm not able to do very long or elaborate outings on weekdays. It's mostly just the park. So, okay, I mean, I guess first what I feel like I'm hearing is that there's supposed to's and have to's in the question. So I think it might be really helpful to let go of that and just really go back to watching your child, connecting with your child. Part of his interest may be that it fits into your life well right now with the new baby, and that's okay. You know, the new baby is a part of your life, and it's a time of change and adjustment. And I guess what I feel most is that I would just be gentle with yourself and everyone as you all figure out this new normal for your family and just continue to look for ways to connect and be together and trust that connection and just know that, you know, when you're coming at it with that love and desire for connection, that things will just flow and opportunities will open up. But again, just be gentle with yourself and let go of this unschooling has to look like this, or I'm supposed to be doing that, because I feel like that might be causing the stumbling right now. And so, Anne? Yes, I agree. And it seems like we've had a lot of questions like this lately, and um, I think we can start looking at it like when we um, see the child doing something that we think, oh, he's doing that so much, I should, you know, put out other things that distract him away from it, you know, the child's always going to feel that you're trying to distract him away from what he's doing. So the minute we think that we need to move our child away from something, that's the red flag that comes up that we need to really um, listen to and go deeper. So, the, you know, the minute we see that, the red flag comes up and we can utilize that and start from there and build an even stronger relationship with our child. Um, build the trust that the trust that is needed with our child, because like I said, they can feel the difference. So what you can do is go deeper instead of saying, oh, I need to do something to get them away. No, go deeper into what you, your child is doing and really see your child. It's a wonderful opportunity to truly know him even more and um, to see what he's doing and uh, ask him, you know, if he can, you can watch him play because you enjoy uh, what he's doing. If you have a tablet, you could play games uh, that require two people that he might be interested in. Um, even on his own tablet, ask if you can try to play the game. My kids used to love when they were the ones showing me how to play a game. And actually from mm -hmm. that very first time they did so, they were always the ones to show me how to play a game, and they still are the ones. <laughs> so um, that those are fun ways for you to connect and build the foundation. Because um, when the red flag comes up, where you need to get them away from doing something, you can know that that's pushing your child away from you. And your other option to go to it with diving in deeper with him and what he loves to do is making your relationship stronger. Because your child feels like he's truly being seen and heard and valued and that you're not trying to take him away from what he loves. Because our, the bottom line is um, to celebrate all of who the child is, well, we need to fully celebrate what they're doing because that's a part of who our child is, what they love to do. Pam? 
yeah, I'm going to touch on a couple of things you guys mentioned and dig a bit deeper. I really like that I, that idea of the red flag that Anne mentioned, um, because when we're feeling at odds with something, it does help to dig deeper. That's how we figure out what's going on for us, the roots of that. And from what you've written, it sounds um, like you're not so much concerned about your son's technology use, but that you're feeling like you're failing at some unschooling expectation, like Anna was talking about. So definitely it's really useful to dig into that um, because you want to understand why you're, you're feeling that have to, why that's gnawing at you. Now, the idea of offering other activities to your child um, comes from wanting to check in and see that they aren't choosing an activity just because they're bored and can't think of something else to do. So they keep going back to it. So if you've heard suggestions like that, that's where that that's coming from. But the thing is that there's no wrong answer to that suggestion. If they choose to stay with their activity, that is perfectly fine too. It usually means they're engaged and happy with it. Like you said, he is learning and happy when he's on his iPad. Or it may mean that they're choosing what they're doing for other reasons like comfort or relaxation and that's fine too. But what the information you're getting out of it is knowing that they know that there's other things around to choose from and we know they are making this choice. Um, and yes, sometimes <clears throat> the choice that they make um, may mean they don't do other things and they might look back later on and wish they'd made a different choice. But that's OK, too, because they're learning from that experience. Um, the other thing that I noticed uh, that that I wanted to chat a little bit about was your word choice. I don't want to force him at all. Because sometimes when we're moving to unschooling, we can get caught up in the idea of not forcing our children to do things and begin to worry that anything we say is going to be forcing them in some way. So we find ourselves scared to say anything. Um, but there is so much room to play between not forcing a child and not doing anything. There's room for conversations, for connection, for encouragement, to find out what they're thinking, to share what you're thinking, um, to come up with other plans, to make contingency plans about plans. So it's, it's not about making elaborate plans themselves or about choosing one kind of activity over another. It's all about, like Anna and Anna said, our connection with our child. Does it feel like when you're asking him about another activity, does it feel like you guys are working together, that you're making that choice um, because you think he might really be uh, interested in it or because you think, gee, I should be offering up all these other choices? And if I read it wrong and the question really was about the technology I just think it would help to think not in terms of the technology, whether he's on or off his tablet, but again, in terms of connection. I think so much of the angst over technology is at the root, angst over our connection with our child. If we want to engage and connect with our children, instead of trying to convince them to stop what they're doing and come and join us, it's so much more helpful if we choose to join them. Well, and had tons of ideas about that. So yes, you can offer other activities, but first get your connection strong. First realize the motivation um, with which you're offering these other activities. And then you can start to bring that connection into all sorts of places, but you won't feel um, as much angst about it because now you'll know these, this is his choice. This is what he's doing. This is his joy. And I'm connecting with him there. And that's the part that's important. And you can then take that connection into any of your activities. Uh, yeah. I okay. To, so, oh, go ahead. I wanted to add, especially um, you said I believe you said you're fairly new to unschooling. You've been trying to make changes that lead toward radical unschooling. So yeah. if in the past he has, you have limited his use, then he's still holding tightly onto that. And that's why your foundation and your life's energy needs to go into um, building up the trust that you have together and um, what Pam was just saying there to make that the focus. And then then you'll be able to um, have more balanced conversations with each other where it doesn't seem like you have all the power with your words as they used to have if you're new to radical unschooling. Mm -hmm. 
So shall I move on to the next question? Sure. Sure. <laughs> next question is from sure. Alexandra. Hello, thank you again for taking time answering our questions. It is really interesting and useful for parents. My question is, I usually hear about honesty in the unschooling life philosophy, and what about telling children about Santa and the Tooth Fairy? Should parents be honest with their children, or should they lie about all those invented fairy tale characters who bring their children presents and money? Kind regards, Alexandra. <laughs> Alexandra, I really love your question, and I've always loved this conversation. We have discussed this topic very often on the Shine With Unschooling list, and it's in the archives. But I've always loved hearing other people's thoughts and feelings on the topic, um, mostly because there's no one right answer, and it depends on the family and mostly on the child. So my family story on this topic is this. Um, as much as my husband and I examined everything that we had once thought to be true and necessary about life and parenting our child, and as much as we discarded most of mainstream society's beliefs and definitions and expectations of children because it seemed torturous to our child and not honoring of who he is, this is one area in which it didn't even occur to us that we should examine. But that's because the Santa thing didn't seem like it was something to examine because we saw society giving joy to children. And that was unusual and felt like something we could get behind. That was the basis of our lives. So we kind of just continued with what we knew of the story that Santa brings presents on Christmas Eve. The thing is, though, that our Jacob, our firstborn, has always been so deep and sensitive and takes everything to heart. And we did not account for that. Um, Jacob always felt as though he had a very special relationship with Santa Claus. He always talked about the real Santa. He felt like the real Santa was his best friend. And he knew the Santas he encountered in stores and whatever, and parades, that they were not the real one, because after talking to them a couple of times, um, they would ask him his name. And Jacob would be outraged, knowing that the real Santa, his best friend, would know his name. And the real Santa knows what he loves and what makes him light up and what he could bring him for Christmas. <laughs> so these were our conversations about Santa with him having this real relationship with this person. Um, one Christmas, Jacob got out of our family bed and ran to the living room and he came back crying. And I asked him what was wrong. And he said that there were a lot of presents in the living room, but he didn't want any he just wanted to see and talk to and hug his best friend, Santa Claus. And honestly, I knew right in that moment how I could have done this all differently. The presents were not important to him. His relationship with Santa was what was important to him. And he was thoroughly devastated years later when he came right out and asked if Santa brings the presents. In that moment, I realized how I had been bearing how bad I felt about lying to him underneath the facade of the joy of Christmas morning. It felt really awful because our entire lives and our entire family was built around this foundation of truth and trust. And it was clear in that moment that Jacob did not feel this was an acceptable lie. And I felt the same way. So since then, we've had numerous conversations about this, about what um, we could have done differently, about what my boys would like to do with their own families. And I have apologized profusely for not knowing any better at the time. Um, we all now feel that we would want to have the spirit of Santa Claus be a part of our Christmas, talking about him, celebrating him, and yes, even believing in him, <laughs> believing in him as he represents love and goodness and giving and magic. And that's the relationship aspect of Santa Claus that the child can still have and connect with. That's what was important to Jacob. And we all feel in my family that we would just not have the presence be a part of our Santa story. Um, and because of your question, I wanted to bring it up again with my now 26-year-old Jacob. So I sent him your question to see if he had anything else to add. And he wrote, I'm pretty sure that if the magic didn't manifest itself in the form of Santa when I was young, it would have come from somewhere else. So that's our story. And here's the other thing. Our unschooling lives are pretty close to being magical every day. Um, we really create our own magic by following what our children love and what feels good to them. And, and add our enthusiasm, our own joy and excitement and appreciation for this amazing life we're living. 
you know, Christmas with my now adult young men honestly feels more magical than ever because we're not perpetuating the lie. And we create our own magic as well as holding on to our magical childhood wonder during that time. So as I said earlier, and as is true of all unschooling, there's no one absolutely right formula. Because the best thing we do as radical unschoolers, as I said, is to know our children and create a life and a world that allows them to shine and feel good about themselves and to be happy. So to take that into consideration is cool. And I know not every child is like my Jacob or Sam, and many children do just flow with a new knowledge that it was the parents bringing the gifts, not Santa. And like I said, I am so fascinated by all the stories and all the families' traditions and ways they do it. Um, Mostly, I simply love the fact that so much thoughtfulness is a factor in how each family chooses to proceed with a topic and with their own family traditions. Pam? Pam? Uh, yeah, that, that was <laughs> basically, you know, my, my same approach to it. I don't think there is a right or wrong answer, as Anne mentioned, and it really depends on the people involved, especially on the child and, um, you know, feeling out with it, within your conversations with them, um, what direction might work best for them. Um, and even if, if you did, I guess one thing I wanted to say was if you, you know, choose not to um, go with the Santa or the Tooth Fairy story, I think it's just um, not to do it in like a sit down, I'm going to destroy your fantasy kind of talk, but just to be more open about the process. And it comes up in conversations. Um, I'll just share our story because we were, as as Anne said, one where it wasn't um that big a deal we uh did do santa and the tooth fairy and it was fun to create well mostly santa the atmosphere of excitement and fun and i mean that's one thing unschooling families aren't going to do they aren't going to use the idea of santa to manipulate our child's behavior or anything like that right so it is just about the the joy and the fun and the excitement um and as my kids figured it out or just started asking questions. I didn't try to deny it or, you know, outright lie about it or prolong it. Um, One thing I did, though, was sometimes I recall asking them if they really wanted to know, you know, so they knew it was a question. And did they enjoy kind of not knowing yet? You know, and sometimes they did want to wait. I think Lissy waited a while before she really wanted to know the answer. Um, And the older kids, as they figured it out, had lots of fun creating that atmosphere and keeping that magic um, alive for the younger ones, too. So none of it felt manipulative at all. Um, But again, you know, that was my kids. And it really depends on uh, the children that, that are involved. And yes, you know, Christmas is just as exciting now, even with my adult children because it is the joy and the fun and, and their traditions that we've liked. And, you know, that's, that was one piece I remember from unschooling Christmas, even when they were younger was because we are um, helping them meet their needs all year. They, they're not like in anticipation of, I need to get X, Y, and Z at Christmas. Right. So it became more about, um, it became more about the gifting as in these are, you know, gifts of things that I think you will enjoy, not you have to wait for Christmas for this thing that I know you really want. No, we, they can have it, you know, in November, if that's when the interest peaks and they want this particular thing. So that kind of took the pressure off of Christmas and that we could real, really just, you know, make it magical, be together and enjoy the gift giving part. Anna? Right. So for us, um, we chose not to tell the stories of Santa and the Tooth Fairy um, really from the beginning. So like for teeth, what we did was we had a charm bracelet. Each girl had a charm bracelet. And every time they'd lose a tooth, we would go and they would pick a charm and create a charm bracelet. So that was fun. Um, And for Santa, you know, they would hear about Santa, obviously, in books and movies and around, but it wasn't something that we kind of perpetuated at home. And as they got a little bit older and wanted to talk more about it, but still really very young, you know, I talked about how for me, because in my family, I'm the gift giver, not just for my immediate family, but like for my 
you know, sister and brothers and their families. Like that, it's something that I love. I love this time of year and I love finding that surprise gift that somebody, you know, will enjoy because I listen to people and I enjoy that piece of it. So I shared that joy with my kids, like how I loved playing that role of Santa and that we all kind of can play that role. And then they would enjoy then playing the role of Santa with me to find things for their aunt or for that. So that's kind of how we talked about it. Um, I have known people, you know, and being one of them who, you know, have done it other ways. And, and sometimes I, I, that transition worked out great. Like Pam said, it was just really natural and whatever. And sometimes it didn't, you know, so I think it's really just about finding what feels best to ourselves and our family. Like you both have said, I knew for me, it needed to feel good to me. And, and I totally hear what you guys are saying, because we have to look at our kids and do that. But, but I feel like I needed to come from an authentic place and it didn't feel authentic to me. And so I had to listen to that even more so, you know, for me, because I, I, I feel like that probably sets the stage for things. Um, but interestingly, we talk about magic in the world around us all the time, because that feels authentic to me. I see magic everywhere. And so they have grown up with me sharing my awe and magic and nature and the world around me. And I'm sure for other people that wouldn't feel good. So again, I think it's just an illustration of why it's such an individual choice, but find something that really resonates and feels good to you and to your kids. And then, you know, I think that will, everything just kind of flows from there. I love how you said, Anna, about how, you know, you love doing the part of Santa and you talk about how they can be Santa. And that's mm -hmm. I, I, what I was saying is like now we do enjoy Christmas more for that reason, because we do say, you know, oh, I want Santa, Santa to bring this to me. And it's not about, you know, I don't feel bad right. anymore that it's about the guy. It's a it's a fun thing. And it is this uh, it does bring about a wonderful childhood wonder. And, uh, you know, that's what I'm saying about creating our own magic. And that's exactly how you do that. That's very cool. Okay, question number three is from Ashley. Hello, my husband and I have decided that unschooling is a path we want to take with our two daughters. They are only two years and almost four years old. We wondered what a ballpark figure of money is needed for yearly expenses. For homeschoolers, money goes towards curriculum, whereas unschooling comes museum memberships, trips to discover new things, art supplies, etc. What would be a good base budget for things like that per year of unschooling? So thanks very much for your question. Ashley, and it so happens that last week's episode was all about unschooling on a budget. So I think you'll find that helpful to listen to if you haven't already. And you're right, there are definitely typical expenses that come with going to school, with homeschooling more traditionally, and with unschooling. But I don't think we can generally put a number on it. It's more about what unschooling will look like in your particular family, because families at school, homeschooling, and unschooling have all have a wide range of disposable income. Um, so if you're looking for some kind of number, um, you know, just for planning ahead, I think it would help to look to your family and estimate some of the things that you guys like to do, because it's like budgeting for your lifestyle. It's like budgeting for life. If your family enjoys going out to museums regularly, you can budget for that. And if you enjoy taking trips to explore new things and places, that can be done on a shoestring budget all the way to an extravagant vacation, you know, so... I think with unschooling, it's more about finding the things that your family wants to do and figuring out ways to do them within your family's means. You know, so I don't think there's, you know, a minimum budget that you need to have to be able to unschool well. You know, I think it's about uh, money is just one other, you know, constraint or parameter when you're thinking about things that you'd like to do as a family. Anna? Yeah, I would say that that was definitely how we approached it. Um, it was never budgeted out specifically as a line item. You know, here's education, here's unschooling. Um, we did spend money, obviously, on memberships and trips and books and fun things along the way. Um, but basically, we would just, as a family, look at our finances and make decisions together about the money that we had available to spend. So do we, we would talk about, do we want to take this big trip that maybe someone had a passion about or interested, or would we rather have more kind of fun money throughout the years as things came up? And 
and you know sometimes we could figure out a way to do both sometimes we couldn't so it's just th these were things we talked about um we're pretty transparent about money in our family and so we talk about the decisions as a family and we would also just have this attitude that if it was something we loved and it was feeding our passion it was something we were interested in we would find a way you know we we would just find a way and and i love something pam said too about the christmas thing because we very much approached it that way christmas was not about waiting for a big item we've wanted through the years we would get those things you know as they came up and as they Trevor, for me christmas was about finding that cool magical interesting thing that maybe we didn't know about so it you know again i think it's just a different approach but but um, for us, it's just about talking and doing, and there wasn't really a budget or a line item for us. Anne? Yes, I totally agree. And that's that's um, what you talked about. Um, if there was something everybody loved to do or somebody wanted to do, that you would find a way to do it. And that's an important um, energy to hold when you're thinking about finances and everything with your unschooling lives because we don't want to – hand our children um, an energy of lack, we want to hand them yes possibilities and no matter what it is. And then you come to um, how to do it through conversations and brainstorming and everything. And I have nothing else to add except to, um, I think for us, it's really important to pay attention to the energy in which you are making financial decisions. And we uh, give such thanks and have such a deep appreciation for those things that we do get to invest our life's energy, which is money, into, which is our children's joy and their interests and their questions and their passions. And, you know, compared to, um, you know, the energy that uh, where you have to spend money on things that you don't want to, if it's a school related thing or whatever, our energy can always be uh, in the yes direction of fulfilling our children's desires and allowing them to, you know, find what they love and fine tune who they are even more because of our investment in them. And that's just such a beautiful gift for all of us. And that's all I can yeah. say on that. Yeah, I think the, the danger of thinking of it as a budget is is in what you were talking about, and the, the atmosphere, the environment, is, as in if, exactly. you know, you have so much per month and this month you're getting close, you use the budget to say no mm -hmm. rather than looking at the possibilities. And yet yeah, we had, uh, I talked with Glenna quite a bit about that in the last episode, so that would be great to listen to too. Anna, you want to do the next question? Yes. Okay. So question four, we have another question from Aparjita. Um, hello, lovely ladies. My husband and I have been de-schooling for about two months now, and we have a three-year-old. This question is about food. He loves chocolate and ice cream, but we did restrict these items previously. So once we discovered radical unschooling, we decided to try saying yes more. The problem is that he prefers to eat mostly sweet foods. A few weeks back, it was ice cream. For several days, he only wanted ice cream for all his meals. We got a big tub of it and would serve it without reproach. He slowly started eating a few more things, but now he's going through a phase where he only wants chocolate chips. It's 1 p.m. here, and he has only had two bowls of chocolate chips today. I'm trying not to show any disapproval and go with it while also offering other stuff. I put out monkey potters, take food to him as he plays, bake different sweet treats, but he is reluctant to try new stuff and honestly just prefers his store-bought treats. I'm worried, will he ever eat properly again, or is he only going to crave different types of sweets? It's also making me angry because we spend so much time making meals, snacks, buying different packaged snacks that we think he may like, but mostly get rejected. I even say, okay, have the chocolate, but what else will you have? And the answer is nothing. Help. Okay. <laughs> um, I feel like Probably part of the issue is the transition, and I think Anne talked a little bit about that with your earlier question. It, it's you're early on, and if something has been restricted, there is this kind of natural, I'm going to hold on to it with a death grip because they're going to take it away, and testing that limits, and I think especially at that age. So I feel like some of that will even out. Um, but I also want to go back to something Pam said in your earlier question, too, and, and Anne also, but about it's not an either or, you know, it's not a we don't have any conversations or we do, you know, there's this in-between ground that I think is just going to be partly something that you'll be figuring out. 
you know, for us around food, we talked about our taste, you know, what we were wanting, salty, sweet, hot, cold, et cetera. And we'd look for different options that fit. We also talked about how our body feels when we eat things. I would share, you know, how things felt for me and what helped me in the morning to get started. And if I was feeling tired or how I liked the protein in the morning or those type of things. I've also know that involving kids in food prep can help a lot because then they're feeling the ownership and excitement around creating food and serving food. And that maybe that could take a little bit of the edge off the stress you're feeling preparing things that aren't getting eaten. So try cooking together, making snacks together, and maybe that can shift that energy a little bit from you're working, 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 and, and, you know, he's just in the point of rejecting, no, not for me, not for me. So maybe together, that's something that you guys can work on. Um, and make it joyful and fun that you do together. I think it is important to look inside and feel what feels good to you. You know, again, we're going back to unschooling is not this set of rules or have tos. You know, there's not a checklist. You know, you're a family and together you can work to find foods and habits that feel good to all of you. And my hope was that we could all learn to all, including me and my husband, and learn to listen to our bodies and learn what makes us feel the best because I found it to be very different for everyone. You know, I, I can't know for someone else, but I can help them listen for clues in their body and support them on their journey as they're discovering that. Um, three is very little. So I think figuring out a way to work through this that feels good will help you both. And so not using unschooling as a way to disengage, but realize that what we're talking about when we're talking about unschooling and, and letting go of that kind of authoritarian regime is to have conversations and to work together and to find something that feels good to everyone. So I'm going to stop there, but Anne, I'll let you go because you have your book too, that might be helpful. <laughs> uh, right. Yes. I will get to that. <laughs> um, I just want to go from what you said about how you all learn about food and what feels good to your body, because that is, that describes my family perfectly because we, um, because of trusting my children, they've been, they've had the sacred space to feel out what is right for them and explore um, paths that we weren't currently on, like um, being a vegetarian and stuff, um, on their own without feeling weight of judgment early on about how they should be eating healthy or anything. So they've got to own how they feel about food for themselves. They've had the space to um, eat food and see how their body feels and reacts to it. And this is crucial. This is crucial for them. They're 22 and 26 now. And um, Jacob is uh, right now he's gluten free and he's going through something where he's having stomach issues. And, you know, the first thing he knows about is what he's putting in his body to help him feel better. Um, and that's we all learned about all the time when Jacob wanted to be a vegetarian. I was on the computer saying, OK, this is cool. You know, my first thought wasn't, oh, my God, this is going to be hard work. How do I do this? I can't even think about this. It was, wow, this feels exciting. This is something my child wants. Let's learn how we can do this. Um, and back when uh, my kids were little, there weren't gluten free options back then. And now, um, you know, Jacob is uh, celebrating <laughs> the fact that there are so many gluten free options now. And that's because know their bodies from being trusted. And the what started me with trusting the kids was a book I read when Jacob was less than two years old. And the book has been revised. It's now called Kids, Carrots and Candy. A Practical, Positive Approach to Raising Children Free of Food and Weight Problems. Um, a lot of people, I've recommended this book in other podcasts and uh, several times, and mo many people find value in this. Um, the most important thing for me is to not place more importance on one food and to not vilify, vilify the other foods, and that's what this book also tells you, to offer things as if they are equal and talk about how our bodies feel when we eat stuff. And so once again, this comes back to, uh, you know, for me, it's another red flag when I'm saying, okay, this is making me angry. That's a flag for us to look at ourselves. Surprisingly, you think it's about the child. No, it's about us. So it's time to look at us and say, what's making me angry? Why am I feeling this way? And how can I see my child better? And how can I know my child better? 
So the answer is usually trust and better connection. Your energy is the most important thing here. Trust, information, and non-judgment. Mm-hmm. Pam? Yeah, I love all that. And uh, yeah, again, I can hear through your questions um, that you're deep in de-schooling. You're trying things out. You're noticing your thoughts and reactions. You're questioning them. And that's really great. I just want to encourage you to keep going. Um, and remember, as Anna mentioned, that he's also figuring out this new environment, right? Um, things are shifting for him, too. I can imagine that he's really happy that he's hearing more yeses from you guys. But I also imagine he's wondering if it's going to last. So it's likely that though you're trying, you you mentioned that you're trying hard not to show any disapproval of his choices. I'm pretty sure he's feeling the tension um, and, and even that's okay. It is what it is. But as, as Anna said, he's probably going to be holding on more tightly to these newfound freedoms until he feels that things are truly a choice, that he's not in the middle of a short window of opportunity right now where he gets to fill up on sweets. And this is totally part of um, the, the uncertainty at swirling around of de-schooling as we're learning, as we're developing this trust, um, and we're learning about unschooling itself. So I think from where you're finding yourself right now, um, there's a couple of things you can do to continue moving forward um, not, so that you're not feeling stuck. And that's learning more about unschooling and yourself, as Anne mentioned, this when these red flags come up, Uh, chances are it's not really about our child. It's more learning for us to do so much questioning and it's really hard, but it's totally, totally worth it. Um, And and Anna talked about all the conversations that, that we can have with our children about this kind of issue. Um, And, and Anne mentioned the book, Kids Carrots and Candy. So that'll be a great way that you can start diving into and learning more about the food itself. Um, and on the relationship front, you've got the conversations um, so that you can um, both you and your son be learning together about how food uh, makes you feel. But also stop setting yourself up to feel rejected and angry. Stop spending so much time making meals and snacks that you think he'll enjoy. Because right now, from what you've written, it sounds like you're making them from a place of expectation, not from a place of exploration of just offering these things that he may like. So, you know, when you think about it, when you dig a bit deeper, maybe you will continue to make those things, but do it because you and your husband like them full stop. And if your son wants to try them, that's cool, but don't expect it. That's those expectations that get in the way. So bringing all that stuff together, you're going to be addressing learning like through, through the book and and other research to, to learn why, um, It's so helpful to uh, offer up choices to our children when it comes to food and helping them explore how it feels for them rather than judging it. And also through living, through your relationship and connection with him and to realize this anger and rejection that you're feeling about food is all about you and to dig deeper into where that's coming from. And I think as you get into all that over time, um, it will help dissolve that tension that you're feeling right now, which I think is also locking your son into his choices. So, like I said, this is de-schooling. It's beautiful. And keep going. (laughs) Okay. You want to do the last question, Anne? Yeah. yeah, I'm going to do the last question from Maria. She says, hi, I am a mom to three kids, ages 16, 14, and 12. My oldest daughter chooses to go to school and is a junior in high school. We are in our sixth year of unschooling with my two sons. They both had very traumatic school experiences. Both were asked to leave the public school system due to disruptive behavior and were placed in a BOCES program, a school for kids with emotional learning difficulties. When we... We learned of unschooling and decided to take that path. My oldest was finishing up third grade and my youngest was finishing his second year of first grade. Being that their school years were so traumatic, I understood they needed a lot of time to heal from all of the scarring school had left them with. We are into our sixth year of our unschooling journey and we are all much happier and connected. My question is about writing. Both of my boys spend the majority of their time on electronic devices and are quite fluent with texting and typing. My younger son at 12 has just started reading, not strongly, but it's coming slowly. He really struggles with writing, though. Whenever the opportunity to write comes up, 
um, say he needs to write his name on something. He struggles, gets embarrassed, gets upset with himself for being stupid. I've tried to explain to him that kids who are in school are forced to write all day long and that it's just practice that makes you good at something. I started leaving a notebook on the table within a month with a month and date written out every day with a pencil next to it in case he wants to practice writing and he often does. But it's it's not a lot, but I figured it would at least put a pencil in his hand and get him used to it. This handwriting doesn't seem to be improving at all and he is getting frustrated with himself. I've read a lot about reading coming naturally when kids are ready, but I haven't heard much about writing. And your experience is writing something that comes naturally as well, or is it something that really takes practice to get comfortable with? I hate to watch him struggle so much and get so down on himself. I'd like to help him any way that I can, but I just don't know the best way to go about it. Thank you for your time. I really enjoy listening to the podcast. Hi, Maria. I really love your question, and I'm excited to talk about it. Um, first, I want to back up and just address what you said about BOCES, and it may seem off topic, but... It has a lot to do with um, the energy in which we are unschooling, in which we are talking about our children, and um, the language that we use for to describe our children and everything. So you know that it's a school for emotional uh, kids with emotional disabilities, and I live in New York State, and I've never seen uh, BOCES as that ever, even as a child in school. Because back then, I knew a lot of kids who went to BOCES, and I also knew they were the kids who the school viewed as not doing well in math and sciences. But from my perspective, they weren't sent there because they had learning disabilities. They went there because the school was miraculously accommodating to those whose brains weren't wired for math and sciences. To me, honestly, these were the coolest kids who got to leave all of the nothingness that school felt like to me, which memorizing facts and spewing them back to the teachers just in case we needed them someday. And they got to go to a place and do real world things. My friends wouldn't just study cosmetology and woodworking and auto mechanics. They would actually be doing those things. I felt like I was the one who was missing out on knowing what was out in the real world because I happened to get good grades in math and sciences, but I knew nothing of the real world. <laughs> so my point of talking about this is it's very important how we see our children. They know when um, we're seeing them and still describing them through a lens that's, that is less than, and it's, it's not fair to them. They feel that. I think it's a wonderful thing that BOCES is available for school kids whose brains don't work well with the school system or whose spirits spirits need to be free. Um, and I'm so sorry that your children have felt that they, uh, you know, were less than they had such a difficult time. I am so glad you're schooling and you're healing and you had said that you're so much happier and connected now. That is so wonderful. I think also it's important for you to just check um, for their healing and your own healing, to eliminate any concept from your mind that they were, um, you know, in school and getting in trouble for being for misbehaving and everything. Um, the fact that they were seen as difficult students to me is a wonderful thing. They were not accepting the status quo. I know it was hard on them with all that school has us to believe, but this is the point and part of our healing from those experiences. That's what. I'm still, uh, you know, talking to myself about and everything to let all of that go and redefine our children and redefine their childhood um, according to uh, the, the our lens, our view from this unschooling world, you know. Um, they knew they weren't supposed to be in that building and look to where look where all this brought you to this fabulous unschooling world and now you're focusing on their joy and their strengths and seeing their shine and the whole thing is a mindset uh you know with your healing um it's good to for you all to know to reject the school's definitions of your children and start with a clean slate and focus on their fabulousness and their shine Okay, enough about that. So moving forward about your handwriting question, um, I hear what you're saying. My, my entire family, we've always joked about how we can recognize an unschooler because of their handwriting. <laughs> Unless, of course, the unschooler has been interested in learning about handwriting or calligraphy. But the fact is that, as you said, they aren't forced to write every day and um, forced to practice writing. 
Um, because uh, as is true of all real learning, an unschooler doesn't see any point or motivation in learning something just in case they need it someday. And that makes perfect sense. It has to have real value in their real world uh, for them to learn something. I have an excerpt from one of my conference talks on my Shine With Unschooling website, shinewithunschooling.com. Um, and it's about how I was Jacob's scribe for many years. It's very, um, it's not too long, but there's stories in there that I think will be helpful for you to read. And I know Pam is so on it that she will have the link to the, <laughs> the link in the show notes. <laughs> So in addition to those stories from there, here's a, when Jacob was maybe nine or 10, he started making a comic strip based on Sam's guinea pig named Nugget. Do you guys remember that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. These were really adorable and hilarious. And I want to go in the attic right now and find them again. <laughs> um, Jacob would be working on these most every day. And sometimes he would bring one to me and show me And I wouldn't be able to read what Nugget was saying because of Jacob's handwriting. And so I would ask him what it says. And he would tell me and we'd laugh and talk about the comic strip. And then he would go back and erase those words that I couldn't read. And he would take more time and care writing out the words again. His brain works a bit on the dyslexic side. So sometimes he would ask me about which way a letter goes and I'd help him out. Um... He was already working on fitting all of the dialogue into the little speech bubbles in the comic strip as it was. So writing more legibly was simply an extension of his work at creating this thing that he loved creating. And it was also part of it to make sure that other people could read it. Otherwise, it didn't hold the value that he wanted it to hold. So my point with that story is that he had the deepest form of motivation to write more legibly And it was just an open conversation that we had if he um, struggled with letters and everything. And he would ask for help because he wanted people to read what he had written. Also, I didn't, there were times when his writing was backwards and things were spelled wrong. And I always said to my kids, um, if they were successful in getting a message to me, by the written word, then that's all that mattered. I understood what they were writing. And through reading and trust that they they would later know how to make those letters better, how to spell words better and everything else. Um, another story, the first time my kids ever really needed to work on their penmanship was when they needed to come up with a signature to apply for their driver's permit. We've had this conversation on um, Shine With Unschooling <laughs> List also in the archives. Uh, um, of course, talked about it ahead of time. And they were already um, going kind of outside their unschooling flow to pick up a book and study uh, how to get a driver's permit because they wanted to get a driver's permit. So they were doing this. So an extension of that was figuring out how they wanted to sign their name because this was something they needed for something they really wanted to do. Um, So they would write their name over and over, deciding for themselves what looked good and what felt good. And I would show them like, you know, what I was taught with cursive, how the letters connect and they never liked that. Um, They would kind of have their own creative fancy printing of their name for their signature. And, um, Again, this came from within themselves. No one told them they had to practice. They wanted to feel good about themselves. They didn't want to be embarrassed when we took them to the DMV. And we as unschooling parents set up our children's lives so that they can feel good about themselves and succeed at something they want to do. Um, One more story. Just last week, as we were heading to our local polling place for the election, um, my husband and Sam and I, Sam's 22, we're talking about what we needed to take with us. And my husband asked Sam if he had his photo ID. And I said, that's good to have. But remember, they identify everybody by matching our current signature to our past signatures. And <laughs> Sam, Sam went a little blank in his face. And he said, well, that's iffy in my case. And that's because he never really needs his signature. And he does it once in a while. So, um, you know, part of them finding a good signature for themselves was making sure it was reusable year after year for for exactly this reason. Um, So uh, the whole thing is it's a different world we live in now. 
Uh, we use our thumbprints to unlock our home screen on our phones and our typing skills on a tiny touch screen has way more value than our handwriting skills. Um, so you never even really know when you will need it. But when it has value to your son, that's where the motivation is going to come from. And I hear you say that you don't want to see him struggle. So as I was saying, you don't need to put him in a position of struggling. When something comes up, you can help him feel good about himself and uh, work on it at that time because it has real meaning in his real life. Pam? I'm just going to step back for a second and say, hi, Maria. I'm very glad you're enjoying the podcast. Yay. Um, and I love that you've been able to bring the boys home, as Anne was talking about, and out of what was for them a uh, traumatic atmosphere. Um, so what I thought I'd talk about is when when my kids were feeling down over the years about developing some skill that they're finding challenging. And, you know, the, one of the point that's really big that Anne talked about is that it's when they find value. Um, it's, it's also having the conversation about, you know, where are the messages that you're getting that you're not good at this? Or what do you think? Um, why do you want to do it? You know, helping them process that. So I, I wanted to come at that conversation um, from a few angles. So one is, uh, especially with, with handwriting over the years with my kids, as conversations came up, I would mention, as, as you did, said you did, that uh, school kids need to be proficient at it and, and why that is and how typing um, is actually a much more applicable skill moving forward right now um, in our culture, uh, how handwriting skills run the gamut in adults now, like the stereotype of the doctor with notoriously bad handwriting. Having hard to read handwriting is not equated with intelligence, you know. So when that frustration came up, I made a point of point uh, of pointing that out when we were out and about, and we saw examples of other people's handwriting. It's funny. Um, just yesterday, I ha took Michael to his clinic appointment, and uh, last night I made a comment because I saw her prescription, and it was the neatest handwriting that we'd ever seen from a doctor on a prescription and you know I pointed that out too to Michael and he's like yeah I noticed that too and we had a laugh about it um, another aspect is uh, if they're interested you can make it easy for them to practice which you've done but if they continue to feel frustrated about their progress especially when they're older you can start to talk to them about it a bit more and ask them find out if they're interested in putting a little bit more into it. Sometimes when they express frustration to us, that venting is enough for them, you know, and we're someone that they can vent to. They wish they were progressing faster, hence the vent, um, but they aren't interested in um, learning more or putting more effort into it. They're willing to put up with a slower pace if it's something that they value. So we just continue to listen and validate. But if they're looking for more, then um, I offer to research different things for them, you know. So if if they're trying out one way and they're still being frustrated, um, it's not so much about telling them to just make more time to doing it, maybe. Maybe I can find different ways, different things that can help them uh, make more progress. Um, so, for example, uh, my eldest had trouble in school with handwriting and uh, – you know, to the point where he was doing everything orally with the teachers uh, for the, the last year or so. And I remember from my research back then that visual spatial learners are more apt to have trouble with handwriting and that even, you know, within the school environment where we were, it was suggested, you know, just just keyboarding as an alternative and doing things orally. And these things are even more uh, acceptable and part of our culture now. So I thought that was, you know, with so much audio content, with so much, uh, you know, keyboarding and computer use, you know, that's a great alternative. They also found um, that some found calligraphy much easier than your typical handwriting because it was about uh, allowing them to slow down and giving them time to form beautiful letters. I thought of that as Anne was talking about, you know, how Jacob would go back and just take more time to do it, that it's more about the art than about the function. Sometimes doing that mind shift helps them. Maybe you might read up a bit about uh, sensory motor integration and look at handwriting suggestions there. Not, um, 
to fix anything, but it's, it's only to, you know, have some different suggestions. Oh, what if you think about it this way? Does that help? Or, you know, you're just supporting them when they're interested in learning more. They're saying, hey, this particular thing isn't working for me. Are there other ways that I can look at it? And alongside that, when they were feeling down, um, I would take the extra time for them to see the many ways in which they shine and talked about that too. Make a point of doing the things that they enjoy and that they do well so that they're this challenge doesn't become overwhelming. They don't see it as like this big thing in front of them, but they see that it just has context within a bigger part of the picture. There are skills that some of us are better at, um, you know, but, or take longer to develop. Uh, and that's just life. It's just, just how people are as individuals. So um, helping them to see that part and remember, oh, the, here's all the things that I'm good at. So, you know, this is just one piece of the puzzle of me. It's not some overwhelming thing. Anna? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, to all of that. And I'll just specifically talk about writing here just as some more examples. Um, you know, one of my girls clearly wanted to master writing and it's, she didn't really even bring that to me. What I would find is sheets of paper where she had just written over and over and over again. And I mean, countless sheets of paper. And I thought it was so interesting. So she, it was just something she took an interest in. She wanted to have a particular handwriting. She wanted it to look a certain way. And she just, she did that, you know, um, and she developed a handwriting that she's comfortable with. And she did the exact same thing when it came time to signing her name. You'd see her signing different ways and finding one she could repeat. She did want it to look in kind of a cursive way. And so she, that's, you know, again, not something we talked about specifically. So she just worked on that and I showed her a few things and then she just practiced until it, you know, made sense to her and that she had a signature that she was comfortable with. Um, my other daughter has some dexterity issues and handwriting never came easy for her. And, and when they were growing up, Raylan, the, my younger one, would always be the one that would write things down um, for the big idea, you know, that Afton would have. Um, she didn't want to practice it because she's also a person who likes to do things perfectly the first time. So that can make things extra challenging when you have an expectation of it being perfect and it takes time with something like that. Um, for the most part, she doesn't write. You know, when it came time for her to sign her name, I looked up the laws and we both explored kind of what needed to, you know, what had to be done, what constituted a signature. And we found out that technically you can just put an X you know, that that's legally a signature. Um, she is able to print her name in a way that she feels comfortable with. So she just uses that on her driver's license, on other things like that. She never uses a cursive signature and it works just fine for her. In our research and exploration, we did find, just like Pam said, that lots of people have terrible handwriting and that it really isn't any kind of indication of, you know, aptitude or smart or not smart. So, you know, just seeing that was helpful for her to kind of let go of any fear she had around that and took that pressure off as she found her own way. I find her print to be very readable. I like it. I think it's, it looks great. And it's like she gets her across her ideas to me perfectly. For her, she finds it slow. So it's not her preferred method of communicating. She is lightning fast at texting and typing. And that's really what she uses most in her life. And so for us, it was really just that, like finding what works for both. Um, I did have tools around the time. If, you know, we talked about it. Do you want to try these different things, do these different things? Sometimes they used them, sometimes they didn't. Um, really, for the most part, it became practice for the one and the other, just deciding it wasn't something she was interested in. And, you know, maybe it will be when she's older and it may not be, because, again, I think we have so much technology now where it isn't that necessary. And so that's just kind of been our story about writing. Uh, yeah, when when it came to signatures too, oh, I'm just gonna say, um, you know, my the boys would they they print them like for their mm -hmm. on the forms the odd time that they have to do it, and and you know they may worry about it a bit and think it and but when they go, you know, nobody ever blinks because yeah. Yeah. they see like handwriting has such a variety. Nobody who has to take in a form with a signature, you know. I've never seen anyone judge a signature like like Anne said. It's just more that it's kind of it, that it looks the same over time. Right. It doesn't matter with the X or you know whatever it is. 
Right. And, and they, they account for the change, too. You know, I mean, like even with voting, you're 18 when you can first right. vote. And okay. so, of course, your handwriting is going to change throughout that time. Um, I just want to share a couple share a couple more things. When Jacob is an artist and um, we went to the Eric Carle Museum one time and we were looking at this display of some of his notes and I called Jacob over. I'm like, Jacob, look. You can't read Eric Carl's writing either. <laughs> You're just like hugging each other going. And it was the same thing when we went to look at Tim Burton's display of uh, exhibit yep. of his at mm-hmm. the MoMA. And, um, it, it just is. And uh, and to this day at the library, Jacob works with me at the library and we have I have another um, clerk named Kathy. And we will just say, like, if Kathy and I are talking um and we see something that Jacob had written down, we'd be like, what does that say? You know, I mean, we just say, and then Kathy will be like, I'll, I'll write that next time for him. You know, she doesn't, nobody makes fun of him for his, who he is because the whole person is taken into account from right. when we see a person. Their handwriting is probably the least concern <laughs> of yes. anybody else when you are encountering a person. It has nothing to do with who they are and their energy, but it is... Um, you know, does come from who they are. And so it is what it is. So that's why it should be gloriously unique and celebrated. So mm-hmm. as always. Yeah, I think it, it's just when issues like this come up, it's just another piece of de-schooling for us, you know, realizing, hey, we're judging this. Hey, he's yeah. gotten the message that it's something to be judged, you know, and to peel back those layers and get past that judgment piece and realize it's just who a person is in the world, who they are. (laughs) Okay, that is the last question for this month. I want to thank you both so much for answering questions with me because it's always lots of fun. Uh, Just a reminder. Oh, thank you. Just a reminder that there are links in the show notes for everything that we mentioned in the episode. And as always, if you'd like to submit a question for the Q&A show, just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the link. Have a great day, everyone. And bye. 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 Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. You can also get your free Exploring Unschooling ebook at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash exploring unschooling. If you'd like to connect, you can also find me on Facebook at Living Joyfully. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.